when I came, I came down from Sheffield to, to study at college in, in, in London. Uh, in London. And, when uh, was that? How, how old were you? That was in 1988, so I was mm. very young. Uh, no, I was about 25. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I, I just, I suppose the easiest thing to do if, you, if you're tied in is just to hire a skip or something yeah. and just throw it in. But I just thought there's, I've held on to this stuff for so long, maybe it's going to tell me something about my life. So it, as I say in the thing, I don't know if it would translate in German, but in, in English I said it's not a life story, it's a loft story. <laughs> so, um, well, and this is so interesting because we just talked briefly and you told me that you had already a contract to write a memoir, but then you, I don't know if you were lazy about it or you didn't want to do it, but then came up this, uh, this idea with the object. And is that, was that an easier access to your life story to get into the, the parts of your life story through objects in a way? Well, actually, no, I, 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 um, my literary agent is here, so I can't say anything too bad about <laughs> the writing of the book, but... Um, Look the other way for now. <laughs> no, well, well, <laughs> initially, I was going to write it about a slightly different subject, and it mm -hmm. had a different title, and I even started writing it in that way. Okay. And then someone at the publishers said, um, this bit that you've written about the loft, which was only about kind of five pages, she said, make the whole book about that because that's the best bit. <laughs> so that was after about two years, maybe, of trying to write it. So, oh, uh, no. No, I mean, so I, I had, had to this start kind from of. Scratch. Yeah, I went home and went. And, oh. then, and then I thought, when I. I thought, yeah, you're right. And so. Um, and so, yeah, it was. It, I didn't really intend to write. A story about my life, but the thing is, from these things that I found in the loft, it told me it it triggered different memories than the ones that were interesting. Uh, you know, accessible to me if I was just to sit there and think, okay, what has happened to me in my life? Yeah. <laughs> That's very interesting. But you know what? I was uh, so. I I know this is not a great qualification, but a very good friend of mine, we used to always send lyrics back and forth from Pulp. Yeah. That's all it takes to qualify you to conduct an interview with Jarvis Cocker, <laughs> apparently. Um, but I always left the lyrics, but obviously it's a very different form of writing. How was mm. it for you to get into the headspace to write longer text and different types of text? That took a long time yeah. because uh, I did think at first, I thought, well, I've been writing songs since uh, I was like 15 or something like that. So it, I, it could just be like a long song. Mm. But, um, you know, songs have choruses where yeah. you just repeat the same word over and over again or something like that, you know. So if you put that in a book, they'd just say that's a, that's a mistake and cut it out. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, a long song will be like seven pages. And mm. also you've got music as well. So I, I, I wasn't really... Uh, qualified at all so I tried to cheat in some ways I, yeah. I tried some work I, I hired someone who acted as a secretary and I thought I could kind of talk oh, it interesting. and then I realized that my vocabulary was limited and I just kept using the same phrases all the time and it was rubbish so okay. in the end I just had to sit down and just you know type it do it and um, and there was no real uh, I, I've not spoken to many of the writers about the process of writing oh interesting but for me there was no pleasure in actually writing. Oh no, the right, you know, I, I always say my favorite thing about writing is how clean my house is afterwards, yeah. because I just like, oh, I could do the dishwasher, I could do this. But um, but the, did you have a plan? Did you have a structure? Were you very disciplined about it? Did you tell yourself, like Thomas Mann, now a great German writer would say, from eight to two I write, and then in the afternoon I edit. Did you have a sort of that type of thing? No. no, um, no. <laughs> no, I, I, I did. I mean, I think I did establish a kind of routine, mm. and I would, I did probably didn't write every single day. But as I say, the actual process of writing it was not painful, but not entirely pleasurable. pleasurable. I think part of that was because when you write in songs, the the first part of writing a song, when you first get an idea, is really pleasurable, and that's, oh, really? that can often be the most pleasurable bit. Like mm. this song can change the history of mankind, you know, mm. like, it's so good. And then and then you listen to it the next day, you think, hmm, <laughs> maybe it can't. And then you try and record it and, you know, so w with a song, you get a real 
burst of pleasure when you first write it, and then it can and then it's slowly it can dwindle a bit. Sometimes, you know, it depends. But <laughs> but with the book, I found it was the other way. So the actual writing of it was kind of uh, a bit arduous. And then mm. as I started to uh, review it and alter bits and edit it, it, it got better because it started to make more sense to me. Mm. And then when it was actually published, and like when I saw this, I only saw this this morning when I got in the car, and I felt really happy. Does your the <laughs> does the English cover look differently than this is uh, the no, German book? The German it's, part. It's pretty much the same, except it doesn't say "Die Dinge meines Lebens." <laughs> it doesn't say that in English. What does that strangely. mean? It means the objects of my life. Right. Okay. Is yeah. that correct? Is that how it's translated? In in the English, it says an inventory. Because oh, that would be like inventor, if, yeah. Yeah, so that would be very unsexy in Germany. Really? In the, if you have inventor on your book, I don't think okay. that would sell well. So I think the so objects of my life that, is better. That's sexier. Yeah, okay. that's not sexy. Good. Good, thank you. That's thank the publishing you. house. Yeah, yeah. Props yeah. to them. Uh, so let's get into it. What is okay. I know you had an I don't want to say obsession, but you have a connection to objects, everyday objects that so, other yeah. people throw away. And uh, what is that obsession, or what is that interest in those everyday things? I, I really don't know. The, I thought I might find out the answer for that. I can show you. I've brought, I've yes, brought one or two things with me, and I can show you one thing that really, when I found this in the loft, I was kind of uh, a little bit horrified, really. It wasn't this matchbox, although it's a very nice matchbox. But if I push that out, can you see? This is... Uh, can you see that? I'll take this out. So walk us so through this, it. What is this, this exactly? Is, uh, I don't think this soap exists in Germany. It is a soap. That's the soap bit. But did I you ever use it? Yes. You did. Yes. Yeah, so I found. So this is I the found, rest. I found it on the floor of the loft. This, and when I found it, I thought, um, why is that there? Because obviously I never wash myself in the loft. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> that is there's very no strange. plumbing or anything. And then I, when I looked at it a bit longer, I thought, ah, it's all about this label because this soap, uh, they changed the design on this label, I think in like 1992 or something. And I was really horrified. I didn't like the new label. Oh, okay. So I used to go to shops and I would reach to the back of the, I'd try and find an old bar of it and then mm. they ran out. And this was the very last bar of the old label that I had. <laughs> And when it came to this stage where it didn't really work as soap anymore because it was just label and a tiny, tiny bit, I couldn't bring myself to throw it away, and so I put it in the loft. And then you just kept it there? Well, then it was there for, like, yeah, just laid there like that uh, but with <laughs> lots of other things for, like, 25 years. Yeah. But exactly what you just did now is what I witnessed in your book, and this is what I love so much. You told a story through that little piece of soap about... England about the soap changing about your hygiene routine that not ha that didn't happen in the loft but yeah. hopefully in the bathroom yes. I assume yes. yeah. and this is what you do here I read this one little piece about the chewing gum and I learned so much about you as a person through that little piece of chewing gum that's been sitting in your loft for 20 years well, and it's thing, such yeah. a smart creative um, just like maybe a trick, like a magic trick, or it, what how would you describe it? Well, yeah, but that's, I mean, maybe now I could think that, but for a long time I've had this stuff, and I think one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was to try and find out why I'd kept this stuff, because I never mm. questioned it. I just had this, a lot of it I brought down from Sheffield with yeah. me, and it was just all there. Sometimes it used to be in the places we lived in black bags behind the furniture oh, interesting. and people would say why can't we just have a bit more room in this house <laughs> rather than just have all these black bags of stuff so um yeah I, I some of it was i mean for instance you mentioned the chewing gum now that yeah. was sometimes if my mother was coming around to the house and it was a mess I would just gather stuff up and then just throw it in the lock oh, right. to tidy. So Don't we know it? We do that all. Yeah, <laughs> we all so, do it. So it's a, it's a mixture. And I suppose, like you say, a lot of people will have a drawer or maybe even a room that they put stuff in. And I think maybe that's why uh, people have kind of reacted to it in a, in a reasonable way in, in England, you know, because 
everybody does keep hold of things. And sometimes when you look through a pocket and you find something that's been in there for mm. years, you know, you've not worn a coat for a long time, yeah. then you suddenly really strongly remember a, an event from maybe three or four years ago just through an object that's yeah. in the pocket of the coat. So that's why it gave me a different into my own life, I suppose, through these objects. And you mentioned Sheffield a few times and that mm. you took a lot of stuff from Sheffield. Do you think, okay, this is now kitchen psychology, okay. but do you think that you were missing Sheffield in a way or you wanted to take parts of that life with you to the big city? Yeah, that, that, I mean, that, yes, why not? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just uh, Maybe, I, I don't know. I, 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 there must be a reason. Um, yeah. The thing is, you know, that all that's for a long time, this stuff was just in this loft space and it wasn't in any way looked at. You know, it was mm. it was all mixed up. And that was the main part of why I was glad that I decided to go through it, even though it was difficult and I was scrunched over and I had to just go in and really just mm. get an armful of things and then bring them out into a room and look at them. And a lot did get thrown away, but um, I had to do that because there would be well, if you, you know, valuable things like that, <laughs> that mixed in with just rubbish. And I had to look Maybe at every single thing. Maybe now after this book, it will, everything will be super valuable. Well, now, yeah, everything's now in, uh, it's now in like kind of boxes. Oh. Yeah. I, I thought there will be a Jarvis I, I Cocker Museum in Sheffield with all the stuff from... That's a, please give them that idea. Okay. <laughs> uh, literary agent. <laughs> Maybe this is a business to pursue. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take a cut of 1%. I'm very cheap. <laughs> um, but can you, as Germans, can you tell us a little bit? There is a lot about it in the book, which were some of my favorites. But what is Sheffield? What kind of city is Sheffield? Because there are brilliant lyricists. You, uh, Al Turner from the Arctic mm. Monkeys, is from Sheffield. He's a brilliant lyricist in his own way. What the, what is the creative energy there? What kind of city did you grow up in that sparked all of this inspiration? Uh, it's a it's was an industrial city. Mm. You know, it made steel. Uh, I don't know why it's produced people who are good at, at writing lyrics. Mm. I, I, because it's quite near to Manchester. It's quite near to Liverpool. But yeah. they're they're a lot more kind of. Uh, in your face about it. Yeah. Sheffield is a, is a bit more kind of, people will really fall out with you in Sheffield if you try and say how good you are. Oh, interesting. Yeah. They, they, that's probably the worst thing you can do in Sheffield yeah. is to say, yeah, I'm quite good at that and they'll just go and they won't, <laughs> and they won't talk to you anymore. So, um, so I think, yeah, there are a lot of very talented people there, but they kind of keep it quiet because they don't want to be seen as a show off. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what is it like then to become famous? I think you were 22 when you reached the oh, apex no. of fame and then to come back to Sheffield where people throwing stones oh, at no, you? I was, I was older than that. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah okay. I was 32. Oh, 32. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Very I just mature. mixed up a I decade. Was, I was very mature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you were, were you stable enough to go back and enjoy the fame back in Sheffield? I'd moved away from Sheffield. You know, I, mm. I, I kind of decided that I'd left. Um, when I left school, I decided to try and make it as a musician. Mm. Um, and I tried that for six years or so, mm. and uh, it just didn't really work. Mm. So I eventually just thought, OK, I've got to get out of Sheffield, otherwise I'll just be stuck here for the rest of my life. Went to London, um, studied at St. Martin's College, mm. um, Thought I would you studied up, film and video. Yeah, so I thought I would end up doing something to do with that. And mm. then just towards the end of being at college, uh, we played a concert and it was just weird that people clapped. <laughs> the, kind of like the first time. Really? And I, I think that maybe I changed because I wasn't thinking that, okay, this has got to be my life now. It was mm. just like, okay, this could actually be fun in some way. Mm. And... Um, and so as soon as I finished at college, I, I was playing concerts again. I never actually tried to get a real job. Okay, and, good. Um, That's good for us. But, but when, when we became famous, uh, I'd already been away from Sheffield for five years mm. or so. So I'd, there was a weird thing with that. I mean, people kind of took it okay but, okay, then, but then there would be lots of kids hanging around going, hey, like that. So, uh, yeah, it was, a weird, it was a weird thing. One of my favorite artifacts in the book is mm. a little list you wrote when you were a teenager, I presume, mm. and it says, 
that was the first act of you becoming a band was the fashion choices. Right, yes. yes. You were going to take. Yeah. And you're a very fashionable man, obviously. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> so what, what, why did you come from the outside more than... Fr like, every, you built the inside after you had already yeah. figured out what the outside is going to be like. Yeah, well, I can, I can show you that in here, yes, I think. it's actually it's, brilliant. It's a, this was one of the first things that I found in the loft. It was this book here, which was a, mm -hmm. like a, an exercise book. But you can't really probably see here, but it's set, there's like a kind of a round thing and it says pulp, 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 almost like a badge or something. So I thought, okay, what's in this book? I'll have a look. And when I opened it up, then, as you say, there was this, which was <laughs> I decided on what uh, the band were going to wear. This was, I guess I was like 14 or 15 years old and... Um, so I guess that's what you call now, uh, what is it, visualization or something. Yeah. Um, but it's not very practical because, for instance, the, it's the first object here is a duffel coat. I don't, do you, <laughs> do you have those in Germany? Like, it's like a kind of a big, thick winter coat. So really not very good for going on stage. I think, ge I think Germany like invented the duffel coat. Yeah. That's the type of, yeah. of country we are. Right, so <laughs> you wouldn't wear it on stage, would you? Well, you wouldn't, but then again, fashion choices, you yeah. know, you have to, sometimes you have to make choices, comfort or fashion, making a statement. Yeah, clearly, I, you were, when you were 15, you already wanted to make a statement with a duffel coat. I suppose so, but I, I think the, one of the reasons that I did that was, it was, um, it was, it wasn't that long after punk had happened. It, mm. Punk happened, you know, 77, 78, and uh, so I would have... And that was a big thing that, that if to say, okay, I would, it, it was quite a big thing. You know, you had to decide whether you were with it or if you were against it. Mm. And the, an easy way to do that was all clothes before punk were quite big, you know, big flared trousers, right. big lapels. Yeah. And then the, everything went really tight. Tight, yeah. And, and thin, like ties went really thin. Yeah. So, so changing what you wore was a way of saying, okay, I'm with this new thing. And I suppose. That was part of it, saying, okay, I'm going to be in a group, so first I'm going to think what the group will look like, and then hopefully the people will come along who will wear mm. these duffel coats and things. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Do you expect all your fans to wear duffel coats when they come to your show? <laughs> if you have to go through the heat on stage, at least the least the fans can do is suffer with you. Yeah, maybe I'll put that out when we <laughs> play some shows next year. I'll say, like, duffel, no duffel coat, no entry. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> but the next part, and that's why I think I view you, or that's why I also introduced you as just an overall artist in a way, because you figured out you wanted to be a band because of the punk movement in a way, because you figured out, oh, it's not all about the music. If you have an attitude, if you have something to say, if you have something to bring to the world in a creative way, mm. you can do that through music. Can, can you walk us through that a little bit? Like that sort of mind shift that you went yeah, through? Yeah, I think that was definitely down again to the band kind of coming into... I, I'd wanted to be in a band, I think, from the age of about seven. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I was a bit young then. <laughs> it, when I got to puberty, punk happened. And that was a really... It was a really big thing because... I'd been trying to play a guitar that we had in the house, but the strings were really a long way from the fretboard, so it was really hard. Yeah. And I just thought, and I, I, I managed to get somebody to buy me the Beatles songbook, and I just couldn't work out any of the songs at all because it just had loads of chords. Yeah. So I just thought, oh well, that's it. I just, I can't difficult. play, so mm -hmm. I can't be in a band. And then punk happened, and there was this famous thing where it said, "Here's one chord, here's another chord, here's another chord. Form a band." Yeah. And they were really easy, so I thought I can play those. Okay, I can be in a band. So it was. Um, it seems silly to say that now, but it really was a very. Uh, it, it encouraged me to to be in a band, and I just thought, okay, I can play those three chords. So I'll write a song with those three chords. And then I invited some kids from school. I said, well, do you, would you like to be in a yeah. band? And I'd written a song and I just went, okay, so you go to the fourth, you know, I just, none of us could play, in, you know, we didn't know the names of the chords. So I said, you make this shape and then you go there, there, <laughs> there. Visual again, yeah, visual like, learning. Yeah, so right? well, it was more like I was going four, 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 three, 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 <laughs> three like that. And, um, and then by the end of the day, we could play a song. 
Amazing. And that was the start of the band, yeah. But it, it's not silly because it sort of brought you to be a writer as well, right? That attitude, the things you wanted to say. You had brilliant reviews in The Guardian and in mm. England. Your book has been tremendously um, welcomed. Mm. Do you see yourself as a real writer now, like Hemingway, Proust <laughs> type of writer? Or how, what, how, has your identity changed in any way since this uh, book I'm came really, out? I'm really proud of the fact that I've managed to write the book. <laughs> Uh, and, and I'm very grateful to Monica. Well, for there are a lot of pictures in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> There's still quite a lot of writing. I know, I know. It's a great yeah. book, I'm just joking. And, and I took most of the pictures myself as well. Oh, you see? <laughs> Artist, Gesamtkunstwerk, we say. This is a German word we should learn. Yeah. Gesamtkunstwerk. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I'm... I'm proud of the fact that I've managed to write it and take the pictures in it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, it stands, on, as I say, that this thing of, of realizing that with a book, the pleasure grows over time. Mm. Right? It's not super exciting at, at the start. At the start, you're thinking, what can I write about? And then mm. you just have to write it, and then you make it better as time goes on. I don't know. I, I'm th thinking at the moment of whether I might try and write another one. Nice. Yeah. I love that. And... Um, good pop, bad pop. Yeah. What signifies good pop for you and what is bad pop? Just so we know what to stay away from. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I guess in, in the book I'm talking about pop, not just as pop music, mm. but um, I think pop was a big thing, you know, in the 20th century when paperback books first mm. came out. I think of that as a pop thing because it made stuff more accessible to ordinary people. Mm. And that's the... Uh, that's the environment that I was born into. So I didn't mm. really think, oh, yeah, if I'd have been born 50 years ago, I wouldn't have been able to read so-and-so or, right. or whatever. But I, I was born during the pop age, and, and it made a lot of stuff... Uh, it democratized culture a lot, mm. I think. And, and also, through that, by making things available to people, it also encouraged people, such as myself, or, or to, to, to make stuff as well. Mm. I mean... A, Bands were, pop music was the main thing through which people from my kind of social background would do stuff, but you also got people writing plays and stuff like that. And so uh, to me, that was good pop. It was, um, it was like an art form that was made by the people who consumed it. Uh, bad pop, I think, is uh, it's kind of like what the UK is at the moment, you know. <laughs> Uh, Just in general, the I don't country. know whether there'll still be the same prime minister when I go oh, yeah. uh, 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 back to the UK. You know, it's yeah. uh, the, the, there was, there was a, there's a yeah. I, in in the book, it's signified the, the the object. I think that I describe as bad pop is a a very strange thing. What somebody published a a kind of cardboard facsimile oh. of Margaret Thatcher's handbag. Mm. Uh, in the late okay. 70s. And Weird this, choice. Yeah, and to me that's that's like bad pop because I think that's when um, people started using the, the tropes of pop to try and uh, control people in some way. Uh, okay, so it's more that than pretension, really. You don't talk about pretentious things like art forms where that are not accessible to people, like the yeah. opera, or I don't know <laughs> if that's accessible or not, but this is not bad pop to you. It's more no. the, it's almost like a pol pol politics thing or like a political thing. Yeah, I think it's just, um, you know, when, when say for instance, like uh, when pop music first came out, it was just mm. considered to be kind of rubbish for kids. Mm. But those songs that were done in the 50s and 60s are still around, you know, yeah. and now people spend a lot of time trying to get the right guitar and, and trying to write a song like that, but you can't because you're thinking about it too much. Mm. You're, you're coming from a different place, you know. So uh, to me, pop is like something from the general population mm. that, that they make something that's got a lot of life to it. And I was, you know, and that's exposure to good pop is what's really made me make my own kind of pop things. Mm. Uh, now, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm not in the, I don't even know what's in the charts at the moment. In the charts, you don't no. know? I, well, do, do you? I haven't known for about 
I don't know, most of this millennia. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so you just listen to your old treasure, treasures no, no, thing? I, I, no, no, because I did a, I did a radio show yeah, uh, exactly. not long ago. Sunday and I, service, brilliant And, I, and I heard new songs, but they weren't really pop songs. Okay. Yeah. They were just 20 minute jazz songs. Anything can be good. <laughs> uh, so, um, Brilliant. Thank you for being such a good sport. I'm so sorry that you had to deal with me and not with the actual person who was prepared for this. <laughs> no, really, thank you. You were really great. And everyone who wants, and not everyone who wants, everyone here has to read this book. It's brilliant. And you also have an official reading tonight. I, I do have so. an official reading somewhere in Frankfurt at Zoom I think it is yeah yeah Zoom, it's a very tonight. cool place is it yeah the Libertines play there next week so. oh, well. <laughs> but you will I'll leave maybe I could leave something nothing for them. nothing I can, I can hide <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe they need it is that what you were insinuating no no <laughs> Jarvis Cocker everyone